Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I am Professor Sujata Sharma as the president of uh, Bio Footprints. I welcome you all today uh, to listen to uh, this uh, wonderful lecture. And uh, let me first um, tell you uh, that Bio Footprints is a society which is all about science promotion and popularization. And in this uh, society, we are also having some. Uh, some lectures uh, which, in which we invite very renowned scientists. And today we have a very eminent speaker, Dr. Janish Kumar. Dr. Janish Kumar is a senior scientist at the National Center for Cell Science, that is NCCS Pune. His team focuses on the structure, function, and regulation of glutamate receptor ion channels that play key roles in synaptic neurotransmission and plasticity. Janesh has uh, received his PhD degree from Ames, New Delhi. And after that, he carried out his postdoctoral research at NIH in USA. And during the six years at NIH, he investigated the mechanisms of inotropic glutamate receptor assembly, activation, and desensitization. He has won several uh, prestigious awards, like the Fellows Award in Research Excellence, that is FAIR at NIH twice in 2011 and 2012, respectively. He was awarded the Wellcome Trust DBT India Alliance. Intermediate Fellowship and also the Ramanujan Fellowship in 2013. So, uh, Dr. Janesh Kumar, it uh, gives me so much pleasure in welcoming you here. Uh, a big welcome and over to you. Yeah, so I'll start by sharing my screen. Yeah, so I hope my uh, slides are visible. Yes, they are. And I'm uh, audible, yeah. So thank you, Professor Sharma, for such a nice introduction. And it's always a pleasure giving talk to a set of audience uh, through various platforms. And I have been seeing that BioFootprints has been uh, doing a wonderful set of lectures uh, so through last several months. And so I'm really happy to be here and to give this talk. And also uh, in your introduction, you missed one thing is that, yes, I did my PhD from Ames, New Delhi, and uh, Professor Sharma was also one of my co-supervisors. So it's an additional pleasure in coming here and giving the talk again, yeah. So uh, Professor Sharma had asked me to uh, uh, give a talk on the basics of cryo-electron microscopy and uh, a talk which is suited not only to structural biologists, but also to people who are uh, from other fields uh, who might be thinking of using the structural biology and also kind of get a understanding of uh, what is all this buzz about electron microscopy that is uh, happening in the field currently. So my talk is tuned to uh, that level uh, such that we go into the basics of cryo-electron microscopy. What is this new development that has happened in electron microscopy that, is, that has made this as a technique uh, of preference for doing structural biology nowadays. So, uh, so that's the, the level I have been thinking. So maybe it might, if it is too basic for some of you, I apologize for that. But if it is uh, uh, helpful for uh, a set of other people, then I'd be happy. And if there are more questions, you can always get back to me, write to me, and I'll be happy to answer your queries. So, uh, so first of all, uh, let's talk about what is structural biology, right? And why is structural biology? So most of you in the audience, maybe you are doing structural biology. And so this might be mundane uh, for you to understand, but we all know that a picture speaks a thousand words, right? And scientific breakthroughs often build upon the successful visualization of objects which are invisible to the human eye, right? And this visualization has been decisive for both the basic understanding of the mechanisms of action of a particular molecule or, a, or, a, or mechanism of a, a cellular process, or also important for uh, going ahead and doing therapeutic interventions, right? So structural biology is the study of the three-dimensional structure of biologically important molecules, macromolecules, small molecules, everything is included here, right? And uh, there are multiple 
mechan multiple methods which people use for doing structural biology. Now, when we talk about uh, macromolecular structural biology, we are talking about structural biology at high resolution, right? A, a resolution where you are able to accurately uh, build uh, atoms or uh, amino acid residues in case of proteins uh, accurately and get the 3D structure of, of, out of it. I'll come to the resolution, high resolution aspect later. But uh, over the years, this, the structural biology has helped researchers to understand not only the mechanisms of actions of thousands of different macromolecules, and in turn, the cellular processes that, that those macromolecules have been uh, like carrying out inside the cell. And so, so uh, it, it has been of tremendous importance. And I'm sure uh, most of you know about the, the story of uh, what the structures of uh, structure determination of DNA, for instance, did to not only uh, molecular biology, but for understanding uh, the whole process of DNA replication, duplication, and uh, later on, uh, uh, figuring out the genetic code and things like that, right? And similarly, also the structure determination of the translational and transcription machinery, for example. So structures of ribosomes or the structures of uh, RNA polymerases, things like that, have enhanced the understanding of uh, uh, structural biologists and all the other, other biologists who uh, take cues from this, these structures and carry out uh, multiple functional assays to further elucidate the mechanisms of these important macromolecules, right? So I've just given a few examples. Now, what, uh, what one can also do with the structural biology is that uh, not only you are getting one picture, but you can, in principle, uh, devise mechanisms by which you can trap the same molecule in multiple different conformational states, right? And you can determine structures in those different multiple conformational states. And then by comparing these various states, you could also figure out the entire conformational trajectory or entire uh, molecular motions or mechanisms, how that particular uh, macromolecule, enzyme, or whatever you are, whatever is your target is actually working, right? And then uh, obviously the structure gives you such uh, information that you can utilize to then carry out a structure guided mutational assays or functional assays to fully understand the, the principles of uh, uh, action of those target macromolecules, right? And so shown here are some of the examples just to kind of uh, excite you all a little bit. So they, these are three, uh, four membrane proteins. Three of them are from Eric Goh's lab. So, uh, and, and of course, as I said, these, are, these movies are built by trapping the molecules in different states and then uh, kind of doing a morph to generate a movie. So a pinch of salt here is that the morphs are not the exact representation of the trajectory that might be happening, but still they give us some insight into what sort of molecular motions might be happening. So for example, here in the first movie, you see that this is a bacterial uh, transporter and you see that there is a domain that is moving, right? And, and there is one domain that is static. And this moving domain is the one that is carrying out the activity of transporting solutes from one side to the other side of, other side of the membrane. These black bars represent the membrane. Similarly, uh, there are these other uh, receptors, which again, uh, because of uh, doing this structural biology assay, you know what are the conformational states that these receptors undergoes through during its gating cycle, the way it performs its mechanism, where the ligands bind, what are the interactions the ligands make. So all this information you can get from, a, uh, 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 from the structures, right? And similarly, here there is another transporter, but unlike the one that I showed you first, this one works entirely by a different mechanism. So here, what you see is that unlike this moving domain in the first transporter, here you see that this transporter does just undergoes a, a conformational change. So this is called alternating access mechanism. And, and so, so these sort of experiments give you insights into understanding uh, how these transporters are working. And you have detailed chemically defined insights into the ligand binding sites, and you can design uh, 
uh, the various therapeutic agents or antagonists against those uh, specified sites, right? And this is an example from our lab where we have looked at uh, uh, a kinate receptor, GLUK3, and we trapped the receptor in different states and then tried to figure out uh, the various steps or what sort of motions these receptor might be undertaking to carry out its gating function. So now I don't have the time to go into these details, but maybe some other time, but I hope you got the idea that uh, what sort of information one can get from the uh, structures, right? And so it's not surprising that uh, a large number of structural biologists have received Nobel Prize for their contributions to science and ultimately to humankind. Whatever research we all do is with a goal that it someday it is going to be useful to uh, a normal human being or all the humanity, right? And so, so large number of structural biologists have got Nobel Prizes and because this kind of emphasizes the point the importance of uh, doing these high resolution structures, right? And because once you have these high, high resolution structures, you completely understand how the protein works, how the molecule works, and you can design specific therapeutics against these uh, various molecules, right? So coming to today's topic, so again, uh, these three gentlemen, namely Jack Dubosche, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson got the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2017, right? And this Nobel Prize was specifically given for developing cry electron microscopy for the high resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution, right? So see, uh, there are three important things here. One is high resolution structure determination, then of biomolecules. And then the third thing that is important is in solution. And I'll come to this. Uh, one step at a time as, as, as I go through my presentation, hopefully it will become clear what I wanted to say here. Right. So what do we understand by resolution? Now resolution is the ability to clearly resolve between two points that are closely placed together, right? And uh, uh, the ability to resolve depends upon the, the, the yardstick or the light that you are using to see these two molecules, right? So for example, uh, if you see in, a, uh, in an amino acid, you have these carbon-carbon uh, bonds, which are separated by around 1.5 angstrom, right? So if you, uh, if you want to resolve these two, two carbons, you need to use a wavelength of light that has a wavelength either similar to this or smaller than this, right? And then only you will be able to resolve these two, uh, two carbons from each other, right? So, so the resolution of uh, these two points would depend upon the distance d. And so the distance d would require a radiation, which is in the wavelength on the order of the d or shorter. So either it is equal to d or it is shorter than d, then only you can use it, right? And so we all know that X-rays or accelerated electrons, they all have the wavelengths which are uh, much lower than the one angstrom uh, uh, distance that uh, we are looking forward to. Okay. So next point is uh, why is high resolution structure important and what, what high resolution structure determination can tell you. So just to emphasize that point, I'm showing here a, a, a electron density map, which is carved at around nine angstrom. And as you can see by this green polypeptide here, it, it is an alpha helix, right? So, so at nine angstrom resolution, you can just with the density appears like a tube and maybe you can just place your alpha helix into this tube, but you cannot accurately predict whether these side chains or even the main chain atoms are at the position where they should be, right? Your confidence in this structure or the accuracy of these coordinates is going to be low because it's at, it's at a lower resolution. It's at around nine angstrom resolution. Now, if you go to slightly higher, let's say six angstrom resolution. Now, what you see some of the, the density uh, from appearing tubular now has some features, right? You can clearly see that density has now got some features and possibly you have more confidence in this fitting here than what you would have in a nine angstrom structure, right? Now, if you go to even higher resolution around 3.5 angstrom, 
now what you see is that even the side chains are very clearly defined right so now you know that yes exactly in this this alpha helix possibly this is the conformation or the rotamers of the side chains are also accurate right so your confidence on the structure increases so so having a high resolution structure gives you a lot more information about the accurate positioning of uh, the side chains uh, and the polypeptide chain and in term atoms individual atoms right and that is very important to precisely decipher not only the mechanisms of actions of your protein but also in case you are looking for uh, developing therapeutics or designing uh, ligands against uh, a particular protein or macromolecule of your interest right. and and shown here is a, a resolution uh, of around 0.87 angstrom of a structure that was determined here at nccs by dr mandey's group and here what you see is that even individual carbon atoms have been resolved right you can resolve individual atoms also even here and if you if you go to even higher resolution you might even be able to uh, see hydrogens okay so so why high resolution structure is important because more the resolution more the information that is there right at lower resolutions for example 30 angstrom 15 or 8 angstrom you may not be able to uh, look at uh, side chain level information but maybe you can look at uh, the overall shape of the molecule you can predict at lower resolutions maybe you can look at large scale domain movements if they are happening at at a resolution where you are around 8 angstrom or 6 angstrom but only when you uh, break the barrier of around 3.5 angstrom or higher then there you are able to see uh, the side chains uh, with proper positioning precision and also the side chain rotomers and maybe water molecules also and this this high resolution information is important for drug discovery binding of ligands and of course uh, as you have higher resolution uh, the better it is for drug discovery or other aspects uh, so more the more is your confidence in these structures okay so now what are the methods that are there to get high resolution structures we all know x-ray crystallography has been the preferred method for extra, uh, for structure determination until few years back and uh, i will tell you why i am saying few years back but but basically in this method what you need to do is that you need to uh, crystallize your uh, macromolecule or target of interest you need to uh, get these uh, crystals of sufficient size and quality that can give you a suitable diffraction pattern and then one can then uh, build uh, computationally process these diffraction patterns get electron density maps and then again in these electron density maps you can model your uh, protein or molecule of interest right but uh, many of you if, who are doing x-ray crystallography would know that uh, getting crystals of uh, proteins is not that straightforward most of the time right and uh, sometimes it takes years of efforts to optimize suitable conditions to get proteins to crystallize and even then it might happen that the protein crystals might not be of suitable quality they may not diffract that well and so one has to again undergo a lot of iterations to either optimize your constructs of your in, uh, protein molecule or uh, again optimize your crystallization conditions so it's let's uh, say for the least that it is tricky uh, tr tricky to say the least to get a suitable uh, protein crystals right and so you would say that uh, uh, isn't it be great if a structure could be determined from protein in solution that means you don't have to crystallize the protein right you just purify your protein and you get the structure so it would be great right if you could skip the crystallization process and yes there is a technique that can do it and we all know that nuclear nmr one can determine the structures of proteins from solution without the ability to crystallize, without the need to crystallize the protein molecules, right? So here you have the purified protein, you could put it in an MR spectrometer and you will get these uh, uh, peaks that you can then interpret to build your structure, right? But again, the problem here is that uh, size of the macromolecule here is the limitation. A smaller protein molecules one can easily interpret and assign the peaks but as the molecule goes bigger in size 
then the the peak assignment becomes tricky even the resolution that you get is lower and so all these sort of problems are there right so then you would ask would it be great if a structure could be determined from protein in solution and this size limit could also be removed right there is no limit to the size of the structure that uh, uh, size of the protein molecule for which you can determine the structures okay and this is where uh, the contributor contributions of these three gentlemen come into picture and the the latest developments in cryo electron microscopy that enable a high resolution structure determination of macromolecules in solution without any uh, like uh, limits in the uh, size of the macromolecules at least on the higher side lower side is still there is some expertise that is required to uh, get structures of sub 100 kilo dalton protein molecules but uh, um, in most cases uh, the, the cryo electron microscopy can determine the structures uh, of uh, without the need for crystallization or without going to nmr so so let's go to a bit of basics here so the story of electron microscope so this is a sketch of electron microscope that was uh, drawn by ernest rusca in march 1931 and uh, we all know that the first stem was designed around uh, in 1933 by uh, these two gentlemen and uh, i'm sure many of you you would not know that uh, the asia's first electron microscope was developed in india because we are talking about uh, when the electron microscope was developed so let me tell you that the first electron microscope in asia was developed in india and it was of a horizontal type transmission electron microscope developed by uh, professor anand das gupta during the years 1946 to 1948 right and he was associated with saha institute of nuclear physics and university of calcutta and and there are the, these are the references where they had published right and uh, during that time they used this electron microscope to also like at least in some of the cases i verified the same electron microscope was used to actually publish really good papers in nature and science things like that okay now coming back to our uh, vertical trans uh, transmission electron microscope developed by ernest noll and ruska so we all know that uh, uh, ruska got the nobel prize in physics in 1986 for the design of the first electron microscope so that's where the electron microscope story begins right and uh, most of you have used light uh, microscopes so there are a lot of parallels one can draw between light microscopy and electron microscopy so they both need light as i talk, talk to you to see the matter that you are trying to image right so in light microscopy it is uh, the visible light and the source source is lamp in electron microscopy as the name suggests you need electrons and so you need a source that can generate electrons right so you have an electron source and then there are lenses that can focus these electrons onto a specimen and of course in light microscopy you have lenses made of glass and in an electron microscopy you have electromagnetic lenses that can then focus these electrons onto a specimen and then uh, once it passes through the specimen again it can be focused onto the the screen where you can visualize right same to same as your light microscopy so uh, so the light source in light microscope is uh, like ambient light and here in electron microscope you use electrons lens type glass electromagnetic lenses in electron microscopy and magnification here one can change by changing the the lenses right you use 10x 40x 200x whatever is the capacity of your microscope and in in, in case of an electron microscope uh, you can change the magnification by altering the currents in your electromagnetic coils that are being used right and uh, you can view the sample through eyes eyes eyepiece in light microscope or now you can also attach a camera and directly visualize it on a on a computer or on a, or on a screen and similarly in electron microscope you can use a fluorescent screen or a digital camera to uh, see your image right now there is one big difference between the light microscope and electron microscope and that is of use of vacuum in light microscope there is no vacuum that you are using while in electron microscope the entire path of electron 
from the gun to the to the time it reaches the screen has to be under vacuum and the reason is that uh, the electrons otherwise would get scattered by the air molecules that are present in the column so you have to maintain vacuum and this will become important as, as i make my points further right so remember that the electron microscopes operate in vacuum under vacuum the column is under vacuum so just to show you uh, uh, a schematic here so this is a 120 kV i think uh, electron microscope and you see that here is an electron source an electron source is accelerated in this column by use of this accelerating voltage here uh, through this electron gun and then you have these lens systems uh, which which call them which are basically electromagnetic uh, coils which are now focusing these this electron in this column through your uh, sample stage where you put your sample and after it goes through your sample again by it is focused back onto the screen where you can visualize it right yeah so see this how the path of the electron is there okay so we talked about that in electron microscopy one has to put the specimen in vacuum chamber now that is a big problem especially when you are going to image your biological samples so biological samples we know water is life and you need water molecules your biological samples in aqueous environment for them to maintain their functionality now what will happen if you will put aqueous samples in an electron microscope under vacuum water will evaporate right and that that will lead to uh, like uh, 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 denaturation of your biological sample so first thing is that and so uh, in early days people needed special sample preparation methods and mostly what you use what you could image in an electron microscope was fixed dried or stained biological samples only those could be viewed right and this is uh, as i already said that liquid water evaporates and your biomolecules would collapse that was the reason so the field people used to say that electron microscopes are only good for imaging dead matter right and so so that that was the tag that continued for a long time now so you would say wouldn't it be great if one could image biomolecules and biological matters but with water around them right and this is a problem right and we already talked about this the problem is that liquid water evaporates in vacuum but solidified water does not so if you maintain cryogenic temperatures and if you have solidified water you would see that the rates of sublimation in that case are really very very low right and uh, another major problem with cooling water is that when you cool water it forms ice right and i just wanted to show you this simulation here which I found on net and what you see is that initially these water molecules so oxygens are red hydrogens are white you see that they are disordered when the water is liquid and uh, this green thermometer here you see as it is gradually cooling you see that water molecules are now getting arranged into these hexagonal lattices right which is very well known that ice uh, water molecule has these hexa forms these hexagonal lattices in ice right and and this slow cooling process will always form ice okay and that is again a problem because ice will strongly diffract electrons and that will obliterate the signals that are orig originating from your sample right and also ice can denature your uh, delicate biological samples as well right so the question is can we cool water such that it does not form ice and yes the answer was in the the previous uh, simulation itself so there you were cooling it slowly but what if you change the rate of cooling and this is the contribution of jack dubochet the first of the no, uh, first of the trio so he added water to electron microscopy and he did these experiments early in 1975 and 85 and he found that if you cool water at a rapid rate it can freeze without forming ice so that that process possibly you all know is called vitrification so you have disordered water is uh, like vitrified it's formed it's solidified without 
the water molecules getting time to arrange themselves into those hexagonal lattices and form ice, right? And so his experiments also figured out that the, for water to vitrify, the temperature has to drop faster than 10 to power 5 to 10 to power 6 Kelvin per second. And uh, he also figured out that because water is a poor thermal conductor, so sample must be thin. So if you want to vitrify something, you cannot uh, vitrify a thick uh, large volume of water, but rather if you have thin layers of waters, you can vitrify them with ease, right? And, uh, and also uh, he figured out that uh, the liquid ethane, uh, which has a higher heat capacity, is suitable for the vitrification process, right? So, so initially he developed some of these vitrification devices where what you see here is uh, this forcep is holding an electron microscopic grid here and uh, the samples are being sprayed by this spray gun here and what you see is that this this is uh, this forcep is mounted on a lever which can just very rapidly move uh, 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 change from this 120 degree movement it can happen and once this movement happens it can be directly plunged into cryogen which is uh, liquid ethane in this case. So what happens is that the sample is being sprayed here and you move this EM grid through this spray aerosol of sample which gets deposited onto this grid and then it gets plunged into the liquid ethane. So you are very rapidly uh, plunge freezing this uh, uh, this sample on on this em grid right and so so basically you are getting vitrification here and and these are some of the first images of uh, uh, virus samples which were vitrified in uh, uh, like aqueous environment with uh, in vitrified water surrounded by vitrified water and this this paper was published uh, in around 1984 by jack dubois group i think so, uh, so nowadays vitrification is a very routine process in all the electron microscopy labs. Now there are various uh, devices which have been made. So in principle, what you do here is that you take your purified protein, you place it on these EM grids, and then you plunge freeze in a cryogen, which is ethane cooled by liquid nitrogen. And ultimately what you want is that uh, the, your sample, so if, if this is a mesh, you see that these black bars indicate the edges of the mesh. In between, you want to have this thin layer of ice in which you want your protein molecules to be suspended, right? So this is what you want to achieve. And uh, now there are, as I was saying, there are a lot of vitrification devices that have developed. And this is one example. There are many more in the market. And what here you can do, you can uh, control the, uh, both the temperature and humidity of this uh, chamber where you apply your sample. And uh, after application of the sample, usually to make the sample thin enough, you take away the access. And this access is taken away by uh, use of these blotters. So blotting pads are there, which will touch the grid such that the excess sample is removed. And then this will be plunged below into the cryogen, which is kept somewhere here, right? So these are all there. And I think there are a lot of YouTube videos. If you're interested, you can go and take a look at this in detail. Okay. So now this is how a, a electron micrograph looks like. So here is a electron micrograph uh, of, a, of a sample proteasome, I think in this case. And what you see is that uh, you have this noisy background and on this you have now these proteasome molecules, possibly I think you can also see several orientations. They are all, they are in all the random orientations. You can possibly make out the top views and the side views, right? And so, uh, and, and again, this is a very good example, but there are examples where uh, the signal to noise is even lower, right? So shown here is an example of one of our receptor, a glutamate receptor. And you see here, the, the signal to noise is even more poor, right? So you are hardly able to make out protein molecules from the background, right? So the question that comes to mind, uh, uh, first, the problem we have already discussed that you have randomly oriented particles and there is low signal to noise on, on, on a noisy background, right? 
So the question is, how do you process these two dimensional electron micrographs to generate a three dimensional structural image? So that was the problem. Water has been added to EM, but then how do you process these images to develop the 3D structural image, right? And this is where the contribution of Joachim Frank, the second Nobel laureate comes into picture. And again, Frank and colleagues during early days, 1975 to 77, they presented a method for aligning uh, images of uh, these individual molecules using some sort of cross correlation functions and and then they they showed that sir ko to main upar se nahi yeah okay i think there was some disturbance anyway so what uh, what they showed was that uh, uh, one can in principle uh, average multiple of these images to basically get a higher signal, right? To improve the signal to noise, you can average these various images, right? And uh, in 1981, Frank, Frank Joachim Frank and Marin von Hill, they, they basically presented a method that allows sorting of these images into 2D classes based on their orientations. And this will become more clear as I show you in the next slide. And then, uh, one can then process these 2D classes to generate a 3D, uh, 3D structure from these 2D uh, projections. And, and it will become clear here, right? So, so here is a schematic, let's say, of an electron micrograph. And you have these, uh, these molecules here, which are vitrified. Once the electron hits these molecules and passes through them, you, it generates uh, 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 images on the screen or the micrograph. And then what you can do, you can then cut out these images from the micrographs and you can group them based on their similarity. Remember I told you cross correlation function he used to group them on similarity. So you can combine the ones which are similar and then from these noisy images, you can get a higher signal to noise here, right? And this thing you have to carry out for all the orientations that are there, more the orientations, the better, right? So, so you, you get these 2D classes, and then you can computationally process these 2D classes to generate a 3D structure here, right? And this was the contribution of Joachim Frank and Marine Van Hill uh, during those early days, okay? So uh, by 1990, the things were in place. The vitrification device was there, which added water, and the processing of EM data was also there. But still, even though at that time, the structures that people were able to get were of low resolution, right? Anywhere around 40 to 20 angstrom. And at this, this resolution, what you are able to see is mostly the envelope shape or the overall shape of the particle, right? And this was also more successful in cases of uh, large, large macromolecules or complexes like ribosomes or big viruses or light harvesting complexes and et cetera. And so uh, the, in the, even in the field, it was like that uh, the KIM is only good enough for doing blobology because what you see is just a blob and, <laughs> and it does not give you any more details, right? So that was the problem. Now, the question is, is it possible to obtain high resolution structures of biomolecules using cryo-EM? And this is where the technological developments came into picture, right? And the contributions of Richard Henderson, the third of the triad comes into picture, right? And uh, around that time itself in 1990, Henderson had showed that it was possible to determine high resolution structure using cryo-EM. Although at that time he had used a 2D, 2D crystals of bacteria or opsin and had solved the structure to 3.5 angstrom. But nonetheless, it showed that using a cryo EM, you can get a high resolution structure, right? 3.5 angstrom is good enough to uh, uh, accurately build your protein mod model into those electron densities, right? And uh, yeah, he showed that use of cryogenic temperatures one could also reduce the radiation damage that happens because of these high, high energy electrons that are hitting your sample. So one could reduce the radiation damage and also it is possible to do high resolution structure using electron microscopy, okay? 
and uh, uh, like uh, Henderson and all have this, Henderson has this very famous review. I recommend most of you, if possible, read this uh, titled Potential and Limitations of Neutrons, Electrons and X-rays for Atomic Resolution Microscopy of Unstained Biological Molecules, right? So here he had kind of compared these three techniques and, and has uh, for electron microscopy, he said that it would be possible to get a structure of a 50 kilodalton size protein to around three angstrom resolution just by uh, uh, looking at 10,000 particles. So if you have 10,000 particles of this 50 kDa protein, theoretically, it should be possible to get its structure, right? But then there were the limitations, hardware limitations, and that I will come to in a while. So this is what I was talking about. So the methods were in place, but the technical advancements are the ones which pushed the, the technique to a level where it is now. So uh, greatly due to Richard Henderson's um, vision that electron microscopy would one day routinely provide images that would show individual atoms or get you high resolution uh, 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 structures. Uh, there were a lot of developments in the field, and one important development was the, that of uh, direct electron detectors, right? And these are new improved detectors, which uh, reduce a lot of the technical problems that were there in the electron microscopy. So along with detectors, also the electron microscopes themselves became much more stable with more uh, like uh, where you could... Uh, have better, more stable beam, uh, less uh, aberrations. These things also happened, but the detectors were an important development. And let me tell you about that. Uh, what what were the problems with the conventional detectors? So before direct electron detectors, as we call them, they were introduced. The traditional low energy electron detectors they used a, a micro channel plate, right? And what happened here is that, so, so uh, uh, let me just go one step at a time. So once the incident electron in the electron gun uh, uh, went on to these detectors, there was this micro channel plate that was used to multiply these electrons. And then these would hit a scintillator, right? Where these electrons would be converted into photons, right? And then these photons would be kind of channeled through fiber optic coupling onto CCD sensors where they would form an image. Okay, and as you can imagine, there there were a lot of uh, loss of information that could happen at these various steps, right? Once at, at this step or at this step, so a lot of loss of information and distortions could happen at this these steps, and that would lead to loss of uh, uh, resolution, loss of information, and, and hence loss of resolution. Now. In contrast, the direct detectors, they do away with microchannel plates, scintillators, or fiber optic coupling. None of these are there, right? And uh, uh, these detectors directly detect electrons without the use of these three things. And uh, hence, the result is dramatically better resolution, signal to noise ratio, and the sensitivity. Now, the secret to uh, these direct electron detectors high performance is this thin sensing layer, right? And here what happens is that once the incident electron passes through this thin layer, it leaves a ionization trail and that is collected and either integrated or counted. And, uh, and then uh, because the layer is so thin, lateral charge spread is very minimal here and hence uh, that results in higher resolution than other detectors right and the second advantage of having direct electron detectors is that these have very high frame rates right so rather than just doing one image at a time what these uh, electron detectors also enabled was that one could fractionate the doses of electrons into multiple frames or in layman terms one could record movies rather than single images and this was really very important step for uh, improving the resolution and hopefully it will become clear in the next slide here so so on the a this is shown uh, shown here is a conventional uh, image coming from a conventional detector now what happens is that once when the electron beam hits the samples Apart from the other loss of information that I told you earlier through the various steps that of the image formation, 
the loss of information could also happen due to movement of the particles themselves in ice right and and this is a known fact the ice can the particles can move in the ice when they are hit by these electron high energy electron beams right and uh, i'm sure all of you must have seen pictures where you are click, clicking a group picture and somebody moves and you see that that person becomes hazy you are not able to clearly resolve that person right and same thing used to happen here so you would uh, get a hazy picture which with loss in information now because of high frame rate and better more higher sensitivity of these direct electron detectors you are able to record uh, movies rather than uh, a single composite image right so what you can in principle do you can go back and look at the various frames of this movie okay and you can compare the various these frames with each other and can figure out whether there is movement of the particles there happening or not and because you have the initial frames and the latter frames you can correct for this move motion right and this is called motion correction and once you correct for this movement all this blurring is gone right and you kind of restore the high resolution information so so this is this is like the key innovation that has moved the electron microscopy from blobology to something that is able to resolve high resolution structural information routinely right and of course as i told you there are other improvements that have happened in the electron microscopes themselves right which have also played an important role okay so how is cry electron microscopy changing the world now right so see now cry em we know that uh, uh, it can determine structures of uh, particles or macromolecules or complexes as big as these mega dalton viruses or in recent times uh, people have shown that even small molecules like streptavidin 52 kilo dalton or hemoglobin 64 kilo dalton could also be the structures could also be done by using electron microscopy to uh, a higher resolution 3.2 angstrom right and so so now this this limit of both the size size is gone right and you don't have to uh, like crystallize these are all structures done from purified macromolecules in solution okay and and shown here is a picture uh, a, a figure that we made uh, a year back and uh, so she see around year of 2013 2014 these direct electron detectors were introduced right and uh, and in this a panel what you are looking at is the number of structures and they are uh, they are colored they are fractionated based on the resolutions that were achieved right and what you see is this uh, this red and blue blue bar right you see that this red and blue which re which represents resolutions either better than 2.5 or 2.5 to 4 angstrom you see that now cry em the structures that are determined by using cry electron microscopy uh, they routinely uh you see that this num this this range resolution range structures are increasing uh, every year right and uh, and also the number of structures that are now deposited in protein data bank using electron microscopy is crossed around 10700 or something and out of those around 10400 something have been done in last 4 5 years from all around the world right so so this is like the impact uh, in terms of resolution that can be achieved by cry electron microscopy nowadays okay and again uh, what about uh, so the resolution i told you the resolutions now are really amazing uh, like initially we would not, not believe when these high resolution structures started to come but what you can see possibly in this figure is that uh, even the resolutions of around 1.15 angstrom 1.2 angstrom recently was reported by using cry electron microscopy and you see routinely 1.9 2.8 1.7 things like that right so this is just the single particle electron microscopy in the green the rest are the other methods which i am not going into today right so you could achieve high resolution and also the field has moving really fast so now what is the workflow we i am sure a bit of it must be clear to you already but the workflow involves having your purified sample putting it onto a electron microscopy grid 
and then put vitrifying this grid and then putting it in an electron microscope collecting the uh, 2g 2d projection or electron electron micrographs or movies in this case and then you process these electron micrographs to basically uh, identify and pick particles on these micrographs which then you can do 2d classification to improve signal to noise and then one can reprocess these 2d classes to generate this final 3d structure right so let me show you how a em grid looks samples like. used for cryo em are applied to the surface of the grid blotted to create a thin layer and then plunge frozen to immobilize the particles at the macro level cryo em grids contain a metallic mesh typically made of copper or gold so you can see these the mesh contains meshes. an array of holes surrounded by a support material such as amorphous carbon These holes support the vitrified particles and are targeted for cryo-EM imaging. At the nano level, the particles are ideally dispersed throughout the hole and adopt a broad distribution of orientations. In reality, many particles adhere to the hydrophobic air-water interface in a limited number of orient... Yeah, so, so there are some problems still with this, but uh, let's just say that uh, uh, in ideal situations, you would want uh, the particles to be uh, homogeneously distributed in this thin layer of ice, right? And uh, then here is a movie that I wanted to show. Uh, this is ma made by Gabe Lander, and it's also available on YouTube. So uh, here again, you would see the various steps that are involved in this single particle cryo-electron microscopy, where you identify these individual particles, average them, to generate 2D classes and then get 3D structures from those. Okay. So I think it's playing. Yeah. So here is your plastic tube that could have your sample of interest. Then obviously, you know, in solutions, you will have uh, the particles undergoing a lot of Brownian motions and all, right? And you cannot ima image them in this condition, right? They are moving and also liquid water will evaporate in vacuum. So what you do, you place a small drop on this 3 mm cry m grid, okay? And uh, because you have to have only a thin layer, you then use these vitro bots, as we call them, where you can remove the excess and make a very thin layer. So these blotters have filter papers, which I hope you can see the grid here. They can blot and remove the excess material, leaving a thin layer of uh, protein molecule, which is thin layer of uh, water and in that protein molecule. And that is then plunge frozen here, right? And you already know that you have to freeze it so fast that it vitrifies, it does not form ice. And so you are coming somewhere from here to this situation where you have a thin layer of water. And in that you have your frozen molecules resuspended in all the possible orientations, okay? Now this is a TEM uh, microscope, an old one. I showed you one before. So let's see, here is a three molecules which are trapped in different orientations in ice. Now, uh, this gray image indicates the detector. Now as the electron beam hits, you it leaves an image on the micrograph, okay? And these shadows contain all the three-dimensional information because the electrons are interacting with your entire molecule so they carry that information onto the micrograph as well and so this is the example i showed you this micrograph before also so what you would do you would now identify cut out these particles identify the similar ones and you would want to reorient and align them so here you see now those are cut and you are going to reorient and align them to improve your signal to noise okay so these aligned molecules are now averaged and you get a 2D image or a 2D class which has a higher signal to noise. And same thing you do for these various different classes which are shown here. So all orientations you will take and you will generate these 2D classes. And then one can gather all these views and combine them computationally to generate this 3D reconstruction of a molecule or a 3D map, 3D electron density map. Now one can zoom in this inside this map and depending upon your resolution, you can build in 
your protein chain or protein molecule into this, right? So, so isn't this a really nice technique, right? Okay. So these are uh, coming to what we have done in our lab. So we have been able to determine structures of multiple glutamate receptors, cyanotropic glutamate receptors in our lab. Some of these are shown here. We have also uh, been uh, working on developing a tool that can help in identifying and picking of these particles automatically from micrographs without any manual intervention so that one can clearly get the coordinates of your particles or protein molecules on the micrographs and process them to get the 2D images. Right? So these are the few things that we have done. And uh, just to highlight uh, the role now CryoEM is playing, uh, the most uh, like um, relatable example currently is that of SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 pandemic. And here, not only cryoEM, but uh, the structural biology as a whole has played a huge role in determining structures of various uh, proteins of this SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that has actually enabled understanding of how this virus uh, actually infects mammalian cells, how one can devise strategies to prevent infections, things like that. So for example, here you see a cryoEM structure of uh, the, the, the virus spike protein with ACE2. So here is just a part of the spike protein known as the RBD and ACE2 ectodomain, uh, which is the, the receptor on the surface, cellular surface, which recognizes where the RBD binds. So once you have these structural complexes, you exactly know what sort of interactions are here and uh, possibly how you can devise strategies to prevent this interaction. And one strategy is to have uh, antibodies that are targeted towards these RBD binding domains, right? So, so these, 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 now here is a, a spike trimer and uh, people have solved the structures of uh, various antibodies which go and bind to the, the RBD at the same location that goes and binds to the ACE2. So once the antibodies are bound, those sites are unavailable for interaction with the ACE2 and thus the infection can be prevented in that way. And also uh, this talk, I didn't go into a cry electron tomography, but again, that's a really neat technique. Uh, and this has been used to kind of determine a structure of the entire SARS-CoV-2 virus as well. And you see here is a SARS-CoV-2 virus structure with all the spike proteins distributed on the surface. And even in the, in the, in, in, inside, you can see possibly the, the RNA molecules as well here, they will be able to see. And not only the SARS-CoV-2, but again, the CryoEM has been able to, like, as I said, there are around 10,450 structures that have appeared in last four or five years due to these advancements. So there is sudden boom in the number of uh, structures that are available now, because many of these proteins like uh, structural biologists like us or many of you who have been purifying protein with very great ease, have optimized the purification, get good yields, but are stuck at crystallization. So many of those projects suddenly moved to cryo-electron microscopy and then people were able to determine the structures. And another advantage is with cryo-electron microscopy is that uh, you could also uh, able to see uh, structures of conformationally heterogeneous molecules. So you could uh, sort out the protein molecules from the same micrograph into various conformations that they might have adapted. And so one can also get in, insights into dynamics of the protein molecules themselves, right? And, and in our case also, we have been able to do it for one of the receptors uh, recently. So these are just some examples. I'm sure uh, you can, um, if you're interested, you can go and look at some of the recent reviews or our review on this topic and can get more information, right? But now, like there are a lot of uh, important big macromolecular complexes which were completely inaccessible to X-ray crystallography or NMR, but have now been uh, the structures are now available because of uh, this single particle cryo-electron microscopy technique that one has used. So uh, 
all the advancements have enabled the field to move from uh, doing just the blobology to solving structures at really high resolution in the present time, right? And again, the, these, like, there are a lot of developments that are still happening. There is the talk of time-resolved cryo-electron microscopy, uh, doing electron microscopy where you are able to vitrify proteins uh, in sync with uh, various kinds of stimuli that you can give, and possibly those could also give you more insights into how these protein molecules work. So those a lot of things, the field is really uh, moving at a very fast pace right now. Uh, not only the structural determination, but also the developments that are happening. And, and so there is still a long way to go. So that's all that I have uh, today. And so thank you all for your attention. And uh, I would now be happy to take any questions that you might have. I think I finished in one hour. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Janish. Uh, this was wonderful and uh, it's really opened our eyes actually. Uh, because, you know, uh, especially uh, scientists like us who have been very deep into exocrystallography and we have been so used to uh, looking at limitations, especially, you know, where uh, we have to work on uh, making the crystal. Because that was supposed to be the biggest bottleneck uh, in exocrystallography. And it's almost like I mention it wherever I go that it's mm -hmm. like searching for a needle in a haystack. It's that difficult. True. True. And you know, many times uh, you must uh, you must remember if, when you were in our lab, many times we just gave up on uh, some projects because we were unable to get crystals. Or sometimes we, we have so many projects and we keep on crystallizing. We mm -hmm. get crystals, but we are unable to get uh, the structure. That yeah. is so disheartening. So this is so fantastic that we are now uh, looking at these uh, new techniques that are coming up and I must congratulate you. Your talk was absolutely fantastic. Thank Started you. right from the basics. And um, that is such a, uh, you know, that is such a nice strategy because sometimes even though we know so much, even then we need to go back to the basics so that we can put, put it all together, you know, and that is what you did. And I just love the talk and um, whoever has questions can please write it in the chat box. Yeah. And I'm already seeing some reactions. Uh, Pradeep Sharma has written a very informative talk. Thank you, sir. And mm -hmm. Dr. Sanjay Kumar has written wonderful talk from basics to advanced topics of cryo-EM. Thank you, Dr. Janesh. And um, if anybody has questions, though I do feel that the talk was so wonderful that <laughs> you were asking the questions and you were answering <laughs> yourself, you know. So maybe there won't be that many questions, but uh, if there are, then we'd love to take them. Yeah. Yeah, now or even later, people can write to me. I, yeah. I mostly respond always. Yeah. Uh, hi, Pradeep. Hi, Ithayat. I can see both of you. So. Hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. Janish. Thank you so much for the wonderful yes, lecture. So I, uh, uh, do you have any suggestions for the biomolecules who show preferential orientation in the vitreous eyes? Actually, one of my colleagues is facing this problem with the mm -hmm. preferential orientation. Do you have any suggestions? Like we use detergents also, we use delta series also for the collection, but still we are getting like the yes. differential orientation issues. Do you have any suggestions that will be very helpful for us? Yeah, so see, it's a very like common problem, this uh, preferential orientation and this denaturation that happens at the air water interface. So uh, you already are using detergents as an additive, then there are several other additives that one can try. Amylamine is there or some PEG molecules. Also people have been developing grids. In fact, one of one, we have one paper um, that we published when I was at NIH where we had uh, kind of developed these uh, in fact, uh, Joel Merson, who was at uh, who was in uh, Subramaniam Sriram's lab at that time, he developed these uh, uh, special method where you could coat your grids with uh, um, PEG. So thiol PEG molecules he used, and those could be coated onto grids which were layered with gold. And now, what we observed for our proteins at the time was that uh, without these coating we would always either get all the protein molecules getting uh, adsorbed onto the grid surface 
or even if they would go into the holes, they would adopt these uh, specific orientations. But only when we had these modifications, we were able to get them properly oriented and distributed in the holes, right? So that is one strategy. The other strategy is that nowadays people are developing these uh, uh, various kind of uh, interventions where you have a specialized grids that are, for instance, let's say coated with streptavidine, right? Streptavidine crystals, thin layer of streptavidine crystals. And to those streptavidine, you can attach linkers. And then if your protein has a specific affinity tag, then uh, those could go and stick to those linkers and are kept away from the air water interface and also because you keep the linkers kind of flexible they are also able to adapt various orientations so uh, those are the few strategies but as i said yes uh, it's a problem preferred orientation is problem and unfortunately there is not a single like there is no single method that can solve the problem each macromolecule is specific each macromolecule has its own personality as i say and so one has to carry out uh, optimizations and most of the optimizations would include use of these additives or if you have many times what people have also shown is that uh, the molecule on themselves is having preferred orientation but some other conformation of the molecule or if you have a binding partner or if you have an antibody against that molecule those complexes people have shown that they were able to alleviate these sort of preferred orientation issues so yes there is no single answer to this but yeah there are various steps that one can take and unfortunately all that requires a lot of optimization time and hence a lot of cry em time which is unfortunately not available in India as of now. So hopefully there are a lot of micro like cryo-EM centers that are coming up and soon we will have enough time to carry out all these optimization experiments and to carry out successful EN work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome. I'll just read out uh, some of the reactions we are getting. Sarika says, thank you, sir, for this informative talk. Anamika Singh says, very informative and wonderful talk. Thank you so much, sir. Ankit says, very informative and excellent talk. And I agree, Janesh. Jia Singh says, amazing lecture, sir. Explained everything in a very simplified way. Thank you. Rohit Joshi has said, thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. So these reactions uh, tell you, Janesh, what a wonderful talk that was. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad uh, yeah. it was, I was able to convey. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, do we have any more questions? So, if uh, there are no more questions, then we would like to thank our speaker. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Janesh, for coming over and explaining everything in such a mm -hmm. fantastic way. It benefited uh, the students, the faculty, whoever was here at whatever stage of their life. That is how you explained. And uh, we hope that you will... Uh, deliver more lectures for biofootprints. Yeah, sure. Someday we can talk on our specific work, biological projects. Yeah, we, like you were showing in the last few slides, that was really interesting, yeah. those structures. So maybe we could have you again sure. over for that. Thanks yeah. a lot for Thank uh, taking out yeah. time. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.